Okay, we're probably gonna have to restart everything because it's, it's not making sense. So um, we'll probably have to go through the whole check again. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay. It was confusing with, we're getting lots of noise from Nikki's tile. So I've muted yeah. so we can clearly know whether Sanctuary's got sound and mic. Uh, mic. Okay, yeah, it's not making much sense here either. So we're just gonna restart and start over again. So okay. bear with us, okay, please, thank you. Sure. Okay, people, we're on hold for a little bit in terms of conversing because they're going to be doing all the technical stuff behind and Marky Sparky needs oh, to you, be alert. You, you, can, you can converse. I'll just be obnoxious and jump in. so they just stay in their darkness. Yes, yes. That's why I like to share it with folks, especially when I'm working with them. Everybody be cool. Blair's back. I need help. I need help. Please help me. <laughs> we're praying. You know what? Why don't I bless the patio and what we're trying to do, and then we'll have our aha. What do you think? Go for it. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our tech team is ever endeavoring to bring us this service. And of course, tonight is a mushmash of technology for them. And they're hunting and pecking for the answers. I'm going to bring us to prayer. And I'm inviting you to join in with me to just magnify the synergy of who we are. And that, we kick it over for Blair, the team, the Facebook team, and the Zoom team. And then you're going to have what's called a magnificent service. What do you think about that? Everybody's a winner. Okay, so right here, right where we are, in the middle of technology, we know God is at the very center. And we also know that each of us tunes into the goodness and light and love of this universal wonder, awesome presence called God. We do that by coming to service. We do that by praying. We do that by smiling at someone when we, when we have the intent to expand into the love and light that God is in our lives. We just pass it on easily as we are in this prayer this evening. So I'm very aware that I am made to likeness of God and that every individual on our planet is also made in the image and likeness of God.
Yikes. We are so blessed at this place, aren't we? Yeah. Man, the talent. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, today is National Coffee Day. Did you all know that? You don't care. Some of us do. I found this. If Robert Frost was a mom, two roads diverged and I, I took the one with the Starbucks drive through and that has made all the difference. <laughs> all right. So let's get started. There is a Hindu legend about a time when all humans were gods but they abused their divinity, and Brahma, the chief god, decided to take it away from them and hide it where they would never find it again. I know you've probably heard this story. Brahma called a council of the gods to help him decide where to hide the divinity. Let's bury it deep in the earth. But Brahma said, no, that won't do. One day they will dig deep down in the earth and find it. And the gods said, well, let's sink it in the deepest ocean. And Brahma replied again, no, not there, because they're going to learn to dive into the deepest waters and search that ocean bed, and they'll find it. Then they said, let's take it to the top of the highest mountain and hide it there. But he replied once more, no, for eventually humans will climb every high mountain on earth. Someday they will find it again. The gods gave up and said, well, we don't know where to hide it. It seems like there's no place on the earth or in the sea that humans will not eventually reach. <sighs> Brahma thought for a long time, and he said, here's what we will do. This is what we're going to do with human, the human um, humanity's divinity. We will hide it. We will hide it deep inside humans themselves. The humans will search the whole world, but they won't look for it inside their true selves. They'll never look there. Ever since then, the legend concludes, humans have been going to and fro throughout the earth, climbing, digging, diving, exploring, and searching for something that is already within themselves. I'm talking tonight about full frontal God. I know. <laughs> Doreen suggested that I should do this talk perhaps unclothed, and I said, you know, I don't think anybody needs to know me that well. I don't think I even want to know me that well. But I want, what I want you to tell, know is that Ernest Holmes wrote this, that the difference between God and man is one of degree and not of quality. It's of degree, not of quality. Think about that. It's of degree. And that degree is about the self-knowingness we bring to ourselves and to our awareness of who we are and what we are. I think, for me, it's actually reminiscent of a lot of the stuff that Ernest Holmes and Thomas Troward taught, which brings into use this term, again, self-knowingness. And it's self, capital S-E-L-F, because we are seeking to know that divine self and to know it as the true self, capital S, lower S, as of who we are. So the hallmark of this teaching of religious science for me is that it is a teaching about demonstrable spirituality, right? It's participatory. We have to be involved and active. We don't believe that we are on the sidelines and that we are here to be commenting on observable spirituality. We don't just study theory and look at it and say, well, that's, that's interesting. Our commitment is to live in a practical and applicable spirituality. We want to practice and use what we learn so that we can make our lives better now. Now, right? Thank you very much. Now. Self-knowingness means that we do the work we need to do to reveal God in all of its fullness as us. We don't perform in order to please any deities or even other people. We don't save up for our good, right? We don't save up our good behaviors and then bank them somehow for some sort of divine tally or heavenly scorecards. You know, we're not collecting karma points here for some greater later. Yeah, I, I know some people that seem to live as if they're working with some weird out-of-time performance-based like heavenly S&H green stamps 
or mystical blue chip stamps, you know, you collect enough and you can go to heaven. You fill up that page and you can trade it in for that. We don't do that. We don't do that. We want to practice self-knowingness here and now. It's the creative process. It's the creative process. It's the deep dive into dissolving all that isn't the truth of who and what we are so that we can reveal all that is the truth of who and what we are. When we rest in that place, we create and we live from our God nature. Again, the difference is one of degree, not of quality. It's degree. What is the degree to which we know ourselves as divine? So Hafiz was a poet from Persia who wrote this. You know, we hear a lot about Rumi, and sometimes we don't know about Hafiz, but I found this, and it was really good. The title is Created for Joy. I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy. My heart is too heavy for me to remember that I have been called to dance the sacred dance of life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up and to lift others up. Oh, sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnares. Free my soul that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. Do you know who you are? Do you know that you and I are created for joy? And are you here consciously? Do you know that you are here? And will you choose to consciously decide that you want to dance that dance, that contagious dance? You know, it's important that we really, really, really grok that we are divine, that we get it here, that we feel it, that we're walking around in clothes and possibly some really interesting shoes. Knowing and practicing this who and what we are is the path to what Ernest Holmes called illumination. Now, illumination isn't just for mystics or people walking around in saffron robes or, you know, the Omi ones. You know, we've talked about the Omi people who just want to ohm everything away and it's not necessarily always the best thing because we want to uh, access our spiritual nature and not just do a a, a spin around the corner in it, right? We want to really drive that vehicle and know that we are divine. Ernest Holmes said that illumination is inspiration reaching a cosmic state, a direct contact with reality or God, a complete intuitive perception. It's the self-knowingness of God through man or woman. Illumination comes as we more and more realize our unity with the whole, but since the whole is the point of inner mentality, it will be here alone that we will contact it. We want to find it out here. We want to find the satisfaction out here. We want to find the relief out here. We want to find the reward out here. We want to find all of our ohm out here, you know. And it has to be done inside. The only God man can ever know is the God of his own inner life. Now, I wish I could tell you that this is my normal state of being. I really wish I could tell you that. Oh, God, I wish I could tell you that, but um, not so much. I have stuff. I have stuff that I've, you know, kind of picked up along the way, family stuff, life stuff, whatever it is, ego stuff, and it gets in the way of this level of, this deep level of self-knowingness and illumination. You know, I have all this stuff inside that I've collected that uh, this stuff gets in the way of my full frontal God relationship. And you know, if you spend any time studying Course in Miracles, you know that the idea about love is that we seek to love, and in that love, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing it in language that works for me, in that love, everything that would stand in the way of being loving is revealed. Everything that stands in the way or might be a block to love, to expressing love, to giving love, and by the way, receiving love, it is revealed. It's not always a really pretty process. It's not pretty, but this is the thing. That's what we want to do, that we, we reveal that stuff that's standing in the way of really being fully connected with God and by the way, with each other. So I read this today. You are not defined by your past. You are prepared by your past. 
course, I wanted to respond to the anonymous writer who posted this on Facebook. But you don't know what I've gone through. You have no idea how I've struggled, struggled or suffered or how hard I've had to work to overcome other people and their issues. I've had to deal with people. I've had to deal with other people and their stuff. That's hard work. Obviously, this guy didn't know that. So anybody remember Gerald Jampolsky? Years ago, he was very well known for writing um, about The Course in Miracles and also a book called Love is Letting Go of Fear. So I found another book of his that I've had on my shelf for a while. It's called Walking Through Walls. What every human being wants is to experience love, kindness, and union with other people and God. That's our basic human need. That's what we want beyond all the other goals and achievements we have, and regardless of whether we are fully aware of it or not, this yearning is in our hearts, it's in our minds, when we arrive in this world and when we depart from it. And he continues, you may look around you and see a world that demands defenses for survival. We think that, you know, that the world will tell us, you're gonna have to protect yourself, you're gonna have to defend yourself. However, there's another way of looking at the world. Recall that regardless of what the behavior might be, what people are really asking for is love. So despite all that we say and do, there really are only two forms of communication, extending love, making a call for love. Extending love, making a call for love. Now, granted, it's really hard to look at some situations, especially if you're watching the news or you see something about someone who has done something, whether it's someone in your family or a leader or something across the planet, and you try to tell yourself, oh my God, that jerk is making a call for love. It's, it's a hard thing to do. And sometimes that's where you have to start with, that jerk is making a call for love. And that's okay. You know, we start somewhere. And if, if you have to start from the realm of jerk, I give you permission. I'll, I will write that down for you. If you want a permission slip, start from the realm of jerk. So I believe that this search, this yearning for full frontal God is really the search for full frontal love, full frontal meaning. And it's that love from in here. It's that meaning in here. You know, I believe that we have to completely rehab our understandings, our definitions of what God is and what love is. I think that we, we might be having some small ideas about God or we may have created God in our image, as opposed to, you know, the other way around. We hear the words God is love and I, I think that's really easy because we're so used to hearing it, we kind of go rote, right? We numb out, we go unconscious and yeah, well, God is love, God is love, God is love. Here's your coffee, God is love. Um, I want to define some terms. Ernest Holmes said that God is the first cause, the great I am, the unborn one, the uncreated, the absolute or unconditioned, the one and only. Spirit or the creative energy, which is the cause of all visible things. Love, wisdom, intelligence, power, substance, mind, the truth which is real, the principle which is dependable. Well, okay. There's some really great words, but they're really left brain, right? They don't always make my heart sing. So... Let's try love. Let's see what Ernie had to say about love. The self-givingness of the spirit through the desire of life to express itself in terms of creation. Love is a cosmic force whose sweep is irresistible. Okay, well, I'm down with that. I am all in with that. That tells me what God is. That tells me what love is. And no wonder we yearn for a deep and intimate full frontal relationship, a connection with God. We are yearning for deep, intimate unity with the presence and the activity of God, which is love, the activity of God. We often get into the mindset, though, of thinking that that activity of God's going to happen to us, that we're going to look out in the world. Where's the activity of God? Where's the activity of God? Well, Here's the thing, you can absolutely see it. However, unless we are coded, and if we are not coding ourselves and aligning ourselves to recognize and to be that activity of God, we may miss it. We may miss it. Ernest wrote this too, God as spirit. God is spirit and spirit is located and appears wherever it is recognized by an intelligent entity, that's us. To the extent that man or woman practices identifying with the one and only source of existence, we become spirit. 
Ah, so let's just think about that. To the extent or the degree that we identify, we become that. Only I want to say this, we don't become that. We become aware of it. We already are that. We already are that. You already are spirit. And to the degree that you and I recognize truth, the spiritual truth, and practice identifying with and as it, we become conscious more and more of what we already are. We are pure spirit. We are creations of pure spirit. We are that. We already are that. We don't have to trade in any, any blue chip stamps or s and green stamps to, to be that. We are it. But until we are tuning into that frequency, through our spiritual practice, for our contemplation, our study, and even through the people that we hang out with and the intention, until we do that, chances are we are not going to have a big full-on, full frontal experience of that love and that spirit, right? Does that make sense? So Sydney, are you telling us that we are looking for something that we already have, or as Emma Curtis Hopkins and so many other teachers taught us, that what you are looking for, you are looking with? It's almost, a, it, it is, it's an energetic magnetic process. You know, when we awaken and we have a dream within us, it's not that it's trying to originate something that, that has never existed before or is magical or impossible. It's that it is calling us to move into an awareness of what the divine has for us or, or desires for us to express, what needs to express by means of us. You and I have a spiritual coding, a spiritual DNA in which nobody else can do or be what we are. It will never be repeated. It will never be repeated. It is a spiritual DNA and it cannot be damaged or broken. You are coded for divine expression. What do you think about that? You are coded, C-O-D-E-D -E for that. You are the divine already. You know, I, I know that the spiritual journey, because I've heard this and I've studied it, it's often one of forgetting and remembering, forgetting and remembering. And I know that I do that a lot. I do that a lot. You know, how often do you, how often do we forget our own divinity and our sacredness? Yeah, anybody? How often do we forget our own connection, our direct connection with God? You know, that's what's so great about this teaching. We don't have to go to someone else and say, please help me. We don't need an intermediary. You're there right now. You are there right now. But we forget this. In fact, you know what? I did this morning. I did this morning. Um, most of you know that my husband and I recently moved back to Southern California from the Pacific Northwest. And we were living there for about 18 years. We sold our house up there really easily and really quickly. And now we're in the process of buying a house here. We're in escrow. We're supposed to close in a few weeks. And we're really excited about it. Um, we're finding that there are a lot of hoops. And in my perception, they're flaming hoops. We have to jump through a lot of them. Now, it's not unusual and it's not weird. It's just that in my perception, because I like to dramatize, I see cans of worms holding cans of worms, holding cans of worms, holding cans of worms. And, and then we're all trying to jump through flaming hoops. And one of them is the whole prove your income thing, right? That's the big part. Um, now, this was challenging enough when we were both full-time musicians. But now it seems that being a minister has its own Gordian knots to untangle around this which is fascinating. So I found myself feeling really inadequate today as I had to yet again resubmit, resubmit my minister income information. And this is just normal process. I, however, chose to tell myself an entirely different story. I had drama going on, I had characters, I had bad guys and good guys, I had a Greek chorus over here, I had the whole thing going on. Every time I think I've gotten it right, this whole money thing, the lender comes back with what I interpret him as saying, or them as saying, oh, no, 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 this will never do. You must kneel in shame before the money tribunal and prove yourself worthy of home ownership. You must prove yourself worthy of adulthood and human ex ex existence. And while you're at it, 
We also seriously question your ability to hold a job, raise a child, drive a car, qualify for a Costco membership, or op operate a microwave oven. <laughs> Shame on you, you lone needer, you. I felt like Dorothy in Wizard of Oz, right? How dare you? I'm the great and powerful Oz of mortgages. Now be gone from this place, and don't you dare darken my door again. Now, that's what I heard through my filters of what I thought were healed you know, these areas of fear and shame, but all the words really were, were, let's tweak this so it'll be easier for you. That's really all it was. Let's just tweak this so we can make it easier. But I went right to the place of forgetting my divinity. I lashed out at my extremely impatient husband, uh, extremely patient husband, sorry, he's, he. <laughs> Cut, can we go back and redo that part? <laughs> Editing, editing, line, line. So I lashed out at my patient, patient husband. And with the very not so subtle tone of blame and my unspoken passive aggressive accusations of, you are the man, you should handle this, you know how I get triggered. That's all the stuff that was behind my, my interpretation of this. I wanted to start chanting this version of the serenity prayer I saw. Grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, the courage to change directions when I see them coming, and the wisdom to not smack some sense into them when I can't avoid them. <laughs> and together we say, amen. <laughs> However, I just held this workshop over the weekend on Rising Strong, based on Brene Brown's book of the same name. Damn but I realized that I had the opportunity to heal some of my stuff. Did I want to? Oh, dear God, no. But I have this commitment to truth. I have this commitment to small t truth, and it comes from my commitment to big t truth. Until I tell the little t truth, I won't be able to reveal and live ah, in the big t truth. Once I tell that little t truth, I can bring it to the light, I can heal it, and I can create space and availability for that big T truth. The big T truth is that I am a whole and perfect creation of spirit, and that what is true about God is absolutely, undeniably, and unchangeably true about me and you. That's the big T truth. But if I have a hidden agenda buried down inside, deep down inside, and that agenda is unworthiness, or shame, or fear, or whatever it is, that big T truth is only partially going to be demonstrated. It's going to be blocked, right? The blocks are in me, not God. The blocks are in me. So I know that my job is to seek to find those areas of my thinking and the belief that stand in the way of being in full frontal spiritual relationship. So I texted my husband and I apologized for slamming out of the house and I wrote that I felt shame for not getting this thing right. I wrote that this was pushing my buttons of not enough and failure, all the stuff that I thought I'd really healed. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been in this teaching since I was a little girl. And I also wrote, you're so good at this and I feel like I'm an imposter. Blessedly, he wrote back and he said that he felt much the same way. Over the years, in fact, he and I have both acknowledged that there have been times we feel like little kids who are playing dress up, right? You know, and I'm in my mom's shoes and the dress is hanging down, the pearls are dragging on the ground, or his, he might be wearing a tie and it's dragging on the ground. And bizarrely, people mistake us for adults and start treating us that way. Ever, anybody else ever feel like, oh my God, how did this happen? I'm, I'm just a kid. I'm just, I don't know what I'm doing here. Well, that's how we feel sometimes. You know, I felt like this when my dad passed away 20 years ago and I had to be the person who took charge of things, you know, the, the finances and all of his stuff. I felt like this, speaking of Russian judges, when we stood in front of a judge in Russia mm, 21, almost 22 years ago, as we adopted our son, who was then 11 months old, the judge asked us if we really loved this child or were we just adopting him so that we could raise him and wait for it, farm out his organs. You got to love propaganda. You got to love the propaganda. Well, of course not. But there we were suddenly going, oh, 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 
No, we're just playing dress up here. We don't know how to respond to this. Of course we love this child. So this morning, once I had identified and kind of brought this stuff up and brought it to the light, guess what? It almost magically solved itself. It got untangled. See, God will use anything it can to get our attention. God always has a bigger idea. I thought this was just about getting the mortgage taken care of. The big truth is, yeah, that's there, but it's more about me realizing that I have a, a block there to being fully, fully whole, free, divine, and knowing my divinity. And so as much as I, I don't want to go through that process, I got to go through the process. And it also opened up a, a level of communication, and we talked about this in the workshop the other day, that when we are willing to be available and vulnerable, that it opens up a level of deep intimacy with the people around us because we are surrendering to the fact that we are just bozos on the bus. So what I get is that if I stay open and available, it's not just that we're gonna get the house or whatever it is that, we ex that we're in the process of doing or experiencing, but there's gonna be collateral learning. There's gonna be collateral growth. So rather than call it collateral damage, let's look at the collateral growth that's gonna take place because everything is, calling us to access that divine part of ourselves that is so ready to bless us. But if we have something there, a belief or a perception or an idea or a limitation that we are holding that makes us think that we aren't worthy, available, or able to, or, or, or any of that ready to do something, then we don't fully demonstrate the divine. God always has a bigger idea. It will use anything it can uh, for us to bring a deeper awareness of wholeness into our lives. So are we willing to be available to a deep and intimate relationship with God? Are we willing to do that when we say we want to do that? You know, are we willing to drop our defenses? It's not about dropping our defenses with God because that's, that's an old idea of God up here out there. It's about dropping our defenses with ourselves and with the people we love or with the people we don't love so much and recognize that we are either extending a call for love or we are here to give love or both. Lao Tzu, and I'll finish with this, wrote this, at the center of your being, you have the answer. You know who you are and you know what you want. Let's pray. Oh, okay. So together we enter into a wonderful, willing, available consciousness of recognizing that there is only one infinite power and presence, which is God. It is love. It is the truth of who and what we are, and it surrounds and fills us with itself, and indeed it is the most true thing about each and every one of us that we are that powerful presence, we are that love, we are that divine, we are here as beings of spirit. And as we own that, and we claim that we are ready to own that, I know for each of us right now that there is there is not just a receptivity to celebrating from that deep level, but there is also now a readiness and an excitement and enthusiasm about moving into a place of deep wholeness in the area of, of our health, of our relationships, of our finances, of our careers, of our, of our joys, of our children, of our, of our artistries, of whatever it is that we are perceiving God wants to come forth, that there is a call for love or that we are here to offer love. We recognize that wholeness works the same way. God works the same way. It's a call to God, a call to extend God, a call to receive God, meaning that we are all that God all the time. We are glorious organized design. We are God. And how wonderful to know that as we align with that and are willing to tune into that vibration and that frequency that the love, the infinity, the divine order 
that harmony and that beauty uh, uses us as vehicles, as channels for good, as channels for love, as channels for wholeness, as channels for healing on this planet. For truly, we are here to love each other, to walk each other home, and to be that power and presence that we so desire to experience. We commit now to be that which we seem to seek, knowing that we are looking for exactly what we are looking with. It is already within, inside, within us. It is within everyone around us. We connect with it, and we know that right where we are, God is and all is well. So with a sense of gratitude, with, with such a sense of, of glorious gratitude, thanksgiving, celebration, Christmas morning excitement, gratitude, thanksgiving, and all of that, that thing that says, oh my gosh, it's here, it's here, it's here. We accept this and release this word into the law of mind, knowing that it responds, it corresponds, and it is done. It is absolutely done because this is the truth, the big T truth of who and what we are. So I know it is so. And together we say, amen. Amen. Okay, so this is the time in our service for our affirmative giving. Uh, for those of you here, you can drop off your donations as you leave the sanctuary in the foyer in the uh, boxes that we have there. And for those of you who are watching us online, you can give, do your uh, giving through our website, nhcrs.org forward slash give calling the church office after service, 818-762-7566. And you can text the word GIVE to 818-457-3419. However you choose to give, thank you so much for continuing to support us. Feeling those intentions of giving and knowing that we are blessed as we do so, let's hold our hands to our hearts as we say together, from the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you. Oh, 
Thank you, Gia and Sam. So as we bring our service to a close, we want to say thank you to everyone who's been of service this evening, starting with our wonderful Terry back there, who is there to usher us in. <laughs> Adam, once again, thank you for the support on lights and sound. To our awesome technical team, Doreen, and oh, Luana, you're here with us this evening. And Blair, thank you for being with us. To Nikki on camera two. Uh, and of course, to our amazing, amazing musical support this evening. Thank you, Gia and Sam. Yeah. And how about that wonderful message from Reverend Sidney? For, uh, <laughs> And thank you to Gail Pallott, who's holding vigil here in the sanctuary for us this evening. It's nice. Out there in virtual land, we also have Bob Lyon holding for a uh, vigil for us on Zoom. Thank you for uh, Facebook Live support from Melissa Allen. Our Zoom support this evening, Lynn Romanowski is our North Hollywood host. Mark Kroll is our Zoom host. Ray Regan is our Zoom associate. Thank you all for being there so we can just continue to stay connected. Really appreciate it. And thank you, all of you who have joined us this evening virtually and here in the sanctuary. So a few announcements. Um, just a reminder, ways you can make your donations. Call the church office, 818-762-7566. Go to nhcrs.org forward slash give or text the word GIVE to 818-457-3419. And a reminder, you can shop Amazon Smile, select Our Church, you'll find us under Church of Religious Science, North Hollywood, as a charity of your choice, and this benefits the church at no cost to you. Prayer with a Practitioner is available both on Zoom and here in person after service. Email your prayer requests. You can send them via email to prayer at nhcrs.org, or you can put your prayer request uh, that you write out in the prayer request box in the foyer as you exit. And you can call in your prayer requests to the church office. It's option four. Our Wednesday evening service next week, again, with our wonderful Reverend Sydney, and it's September. Uh, no, that's going to be in October. It's not going to be in October. It's not September. Uh, again, meditation is at 6.50 p.m., service at 7. And Reverend Sidney's topic next week is my big, fat, abundant God. <laughs> Can't wait to hear that one. <laughs> youth Church is open. We welcome youth of all ages for our 9.45 a.m. service. Our women's group uh, we'll be meeting in person and on Zoom. And our guest speaker, Reverend Sydney. <laughs> so this group will meet this coming Sunday at 11 a.m. in the youth church or on Zoom. Our men's group uh, will meet in person uh, this Sunday in the Ernest Holmes room at 11 a.m. And we're looking for people to help host our services on Facebook Live. It's relatively easy, it's a lot of fun, and so if you're interested, please call the church office. Zoom virtual patio is before and after our Sunday and Wednesday services, and our Zoom meditation is every morning, Monday through Saturday at 8 a.m. And we invite you to visit our website, nhcrs.org, to obtain all the Zoom links and more information about all the events going on here at North Hollywood and to sign up for our weekly e-blasts and our monthly newsletters. So with that, let me call Reverend Sidney back up to please give us our benediction. Ah, oh, so once again, I invite you to settle in. 
feeling the support of that chair, knowing that it is the metaphor for the way that we are supported by this infinite presence and power that we call God, that we call spirit, that we call life. That we have been so blessed tonight by being together, that we have been so blessed by this music. We've been blessed by this energy of this building, of these people, of all that life is. And I know it is wonderful. It is good and very good. And how, just how sacred it is to know that we are one of and one with that infinite power and presence. So I know that as we go out into the world this day, in this night, we carry this energy. And I'm certain that we are a blessing to ourselves, to each other, and to everyone in the world. We bless this church. We bless... Oh, we bless all churches, ashrams, mosques, temples, all paths to God. For truly, we are here to celebrate the love, the truth, the power, and the presence of God as we raise this world, as we raise ourselves, as we rise up in knowing that there is only that one power, that one presence, and it is God. So I am grateful and I release this word into the law of mind, knowing that all things are working together for good. And so it is, together we say, amen. Yeah.